All right, welcome to the 11th episode of the Kentucky Elk Hunting Webinar Series. So uh, I'm back from vacation, really been back for two weeks, but we're, we've got a little little delay in getting these posted. So uh, hopefully Joe uh, took the reins well while I was gone. And and, and um, I think I, I watched the law enforcement episode. It was great. I think that's definitely something that everybody needs to uh, look at just to just to keep yourself safe and keep yourself out of trouble. That's a, that'd be a great thing to do. So, um, so we're going to jump right into things today. So we've got Bill Carmen with us, and he's going to talk about packing out your elk. So Bill's a founding member of the Kentucky Elk Guides Association, and he frequently gives seminars. Uh, and one of the ones that we've seen is is when he's talked about packing an elk out, and he does as good a job as anybody. So. Uh, I ran into Bill about 2006. He killed the first elk in Kentucky with traditional archery um, on, on, a, on a hunting area that was, that was kind of near where I was doing some of my research. And uh, I just remember thinking that, you know, that day he had packed that entire elk out himself about a mile to the truck. Uh, and, and for a, you know, flatlander, Western Kentucky guy, it was completely foreign to me that you would cut something up and, uh, you know, carried out of the woods on your back. So um, to me, I, I, had, I there, you know, I had a lot of thought about that after, after I saw that happen and I thought it was incredibly cool. And uh, it also just it really, it allows you to hunt elk back in the middle of nowhere and get that thing, you know, out of the woods and, and in the freezer. So uh, something very interesting. But uh, again, Bill does a great job of describing this and, and we're going to turn it over to him and let him, um, introduce himself a little better than I did and uh, jump right into the to the presentation. Thanks, John. I appreciate you being here. Uh, as I've gotten older and older, it's a lot harder to drag anything out. And so I found that even with whitetail deer, it's a whole lot easier to cut them up and pack them out on your back than it is to, you know, to drag them any long distance at all. So I'm going to try and get on this uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, you guys tell me if it's not working. Uh, let's see. Can you see it? Looks good. There it yeah. is. All right. So, uh, again, I'm Bill Carmen. I have an outfit called Kentucky Wild. When I retired after 10 years with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, I uh, started Kentucky Wild. And in that capacity, I guide elk hunters. I guide fly fishermen. I do mostly fly fishing seminars. Uh, and uh, do a lot of outdoor writing. I've got some books out. But uh, today we're going to talk about, um, see if I can get this to work here. Well, why is that not working, guys? It's not forwarding here. Uh, let me stop share. Yeah, try her, try her one more time. Okay. Share screen. Uh, let's do this. Now, what are you seeing there? That's yeah, your I've PowerPoint. Got your PowerPoint now. So, you mean can you see the on the left there the? Yep. Or is it's that from, from beginning? Okay. Let me hit slideshow. You're on to that. Yep. Hit from beginning. All right. Now let's try. It. All right. Oh, there we, there go. we go. There's some editing for you. So the, the uh, title is uh, Just Shot an Elk, Now What? How, it's been, I can't imagine how many times uh, I've had clients and even with my own hunts, you know, you walk up to a dead elk and you go, now what? It's, you know, it's a monster animal lying there and there's absolutely no way you can drag such a beast any distance at all. Now, you may get lucky and drop an elk right so you can back your vehicle up to it. But that's very rare, particularly these days when these elk have, are scattered and in remote areas. So I just shot, very quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about blood trailing or just evaluating the shot. So what you wanna do, and again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I think there's another webinar that's gonna deal with it in more detail. But what you want to do is evaluate the shot. Did you see the impact? Is there blood? How did the animal behave? If you're rifle hunting and the elk drops, the rule of thumb is if that elk is still moving, if you see antlers moving or legs kicking, 
you need to keep shooting. Don't stop shooting until that animal is stone cold dead. Uh, several times I've witnessed uh, a hunter shoot an elk with a rifle and it drops. They start high-fiving and then all of a sudden the elk stands up and walks off never to be seen again. So you want to keep shooting until that animal is dead. With archery gear, what you always want to do, it's just like deer hunting, you want to make sure you wait and allow that animal to die. Even if you double lung it and you hear it fall, I would wait 30 minutes and then you know you can go up to it. But make sure that when you do that, when you're blood trailing or approaching the animal, make sure you do it very quietly. And even it, it's even a good idea to approach from downwind because if that animal's still alive, uh, it could just get up and take off. So even if you think it's stone cold dead, approach it very quietly because you may need to get a second shot. All right, so don't wait until you're standing over a dead elk to ask now what? What you wanna do is pre-plan, uh, think of the worst case scenario uh, in your pre-planning. So imagine this, you just shot a bull elk in, in difficult terrain and you're three miles from the nearest Jeep road or even a mile. Are you prepared? So you need to have a lot of gear with you to make that happen. So you need to have pack frames, rope, et cetera, in your, at least in your vehicle. You need to have knives, uh, knife sharpener if you're not using an outdoor edge type of knife, uh, some sort of a saw, I like to use a pruning saw. Make sure you have ample numbers of game bags uh, to bag that meat up to keep it clean. Uh, you need a, it's, a, having a tarp is a good idea because you can lay meat on a tarp, even two is a good idea. Uh, sometimes you may wanna gut that animal and drag that gut pile away from the elk because it's usually kind of a mess. Uh, so having two tarps is even a good idea. Water, Gatorade, energy bars, uh, because this is really hard work. And particularly in early season when it's hot, you will be soaking wet with sweat uh, because you know it's, it's such an exertion dealing with such a big animal. A hoist system is a really good idea, particularly if you have to make multiple trips uh, and you have to leave that animal for any length of time because uh, we do have a lot of bears in Eastern Kentucky and they will get on your, on your elk uh, if, if it's left for any length of time. Uh, on many occasions, we've returned to the scene of the incident. In other words, we've gone back to look at uh, where that elk where we've cut up that elk and left that torso and it will be completely gone the very next day. Elk, a bear just comes in, picks it up and walks off with it. So you need some kind of hoist system to get that meat off the ground uh, if you have to leave it and also to get it off the ground so it can cool better. A headlamp, flashlight, uh, sometimes this work that you're gonna have to engage in occurs after dark. So uh, you don't wanna be stuck out there without a, and I, I like to recommend multiple headlamps because it's a lot easier to just switch headlamps than it is to change batteries. So have, uh, be redundant in your, in your uh, ability to light up the scene. Rubber gloves, you know, animals do carry disease and also rubber gloves will uh, help protect your hands from little nicks and cuts. Uh, toilet paper, first aid kit. Toilet paper is always a good thing to have for the obvious reason. And uh, you can use a roll of toilet paper to soak up blood uh, inside a body cavity. However, please do not just discard that toilet paper because an, another animal like a bear might come along and try and eat that. And it's not going to be good for the bear, obviously. So you want to make sure you carry it out also, that bloody roll of toilet paper. And then a first aid kit, you never know when you're going to uh, get hurt or be hurt uh, in dealing with a dead elk. And then I like to use trekking poles because, and again, I'm older, but uh, when, you're, when you're carrying 75 to 100 pounds on your back, it's a lot easier to negotiate or navigate difficult terrain when you have trekking poles. It's a lot safer. Uh, make sure you have coolers in your vehicle. Uh, you, at the bare minimum, you're going to need two 100 quart coolers for the hams and shoulders. Sometimes you can fit a ham and a shoulder in one cooler. 
So at least two of those, sometimes it might even be better to have three or four. Uh, two 48 quart coolers for the back straps, the tenderloins, the heart, liver, neck, and rib meat. And then don't forget ice and make sure you pre-plan where you're gonna get ice. I've had a couple of occasions where um, uh, I had a hunter shoot an elk on a Sunday morning. We go to the little country store after we get everything back to the vehicle and the country store is closed on Sunday morning. So uh, you wanna make sure you pre-plan for ice. Uh, these, you know, these super duper coolers that you can get now, Yetis and other brands, keep ice for a long time. So it's not a bad idea. If you've got those 100 quart coolers in your truck anyway, go ahead and keep ice in them all the time. Pack frames, uh, I've got, there's three shown in the picture here. Um, the, the two on the bottom are just the frame. And then the one on top is a big soft pack. It's a Kuyu soft pack. What I like to do is keep my pack frames in the vehicle and then uh, carry one big soft pack that's just got my bare basics in it. Uh, and I, we mentioned that gear earlier, but then when I, you know, when we get the animal cut up, I can take at least one load of meat out on the trip back to get the pack frames. So you're going to be walking back anyway, you might as well carry some meat. So a big, large internal frame pack is also a good idea as well. And you can get these pack frames at Cabela's or Sportsman's Warehouse or anywhere. Gear, you can see the gear that I've got there, uh, trekking poles, uh, knife, saw, first aid kit, sharpener, headlamp, toilet paper. Um, and I've got a big tarp there on the right, but there's a small uh, drop cloth, plastic drop cloth rolled up uh, that works well as that other tarp. Then um, the red hoist system up there on top, the game bags, the gloves. So you can, and then bungees and rope and then the other tarp. So you can see all the gear and I keep all of that stuff, except of course the trekking poles. I keep all that stuff in my soft pack uh, while I'm hunting in addition to, uh, you know, some additional water and that kind of thing. And then uh, if you get an elk then you've already got all that stuff with you and then you can carry your meat back the first load of meat back with your soft frame or your soft pack. Field quartering. Um, this is just a diagram of uh, using a picture of an elk. Uh, I had a gal named Mandy uh, who shot this elk a couple of years ago. It's a cow elk. Uh, and you can see on the diagram the different uh, cuts of meat when you quarter the animal. So, uh, so the shoulder is the, the A there. It's easy to see. The ham is the butt end of the animal. The back strap is the column of meat on both sides of the spine. The neck, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the ribs, there's, there's meat on either side of each rib. The heart and the liver, of course, those are internal. And then the tenderloin is also internal. That's like the back strap, only it's on the inside along the, the spine on the inside of the animal. So now this picture is a deer, obviously, and some of these photos are of a deer, but quartering a deer is identical to quartering an elk. It's just that it's a lot bigger when you're dealing with an elk. But I like to use tarps to keep that meat clean. So the shoulder is the low hanging fruit. It is really easy to remove the shoulder. Uh, if you reach behind you, you can feel your shoulder blade. So what you do is, uh, you take the animal and you just work your knife around the outside edge of the shoulder blade and then cut the web of meat and skin under the arm and that shoulder comes off very, very easily. Uh, again, the low hanging fruit, that's usually the first thing that I take off is the shoulder. The ham is a little more difficult because you've gotta be careful and not puncture uh, the digestive system. Now in this picture, this deer has already been gutted, but you don't have to gut an animal before you quarter it. Uh, so what you do is you, it's a lot easier if you uh, have somebody helping you, or if not, you can take a rope and tie onto the leg and tie it onto a tree to hold that, that leg back so that you can work. So basically you just cut down until you get to the ball joint 
again, being careful around the digestive system. And there's a, uh, there's a little tiny tendon that connects the ball joint to the pelvis. Just work your knife in there and slice that little tendon and the whole thing will just pop. In fact, that makes an audible pop sometimes. It'll pop free. And then you basically just work your knife around the, the meat. Uh, again, being careful around the digestive system. And you can see, uh, again, that's removing ham. And an L cam is a lot bigger. It's, again, it's easier to do it if you've got somebody with you. If not, then just tie that leg back to a tree. The back strap is a column of meat along each side of the spine. And it's kind of like filleting a fish. You run your point of your knife uh, on both sides, on one side along the, the uh, bigger end of the ribs and on the other side along the spine and it just fillets right off and that's what a back strap looks like when you get it done of course with an elk it's about three times bigger than that but and that is the primo meat on the animal the tenderloin is really good but it's not real big but the back strap you can cut that into medallions and it's making me hungry just uh just thinking about it that's the best meat on the animal i think the rib meat, uh, what you do is you just basically trim all that meat from around the ribs and it makes really good burger. Uh, you can grind it up and make it, you know, make burger. And on, an elk, on a deer, there's not a lot of it, but on an elk, there's a lot of rib meat. So you don't want to leave that. Uh, it's, you know, it's a real waste to leave the rib meat. The neck roast. The neck uh, on an elk is huge and it's really heavy. So I like to go ahead and uh, peel that skin back. If you've got a bull, you want to peel that, uh, a bull that you want to mount the head or do a shoulder mount, you peel that uh, skin back all the way up to the neck and uh, then remove the, the, ro the neck roast. Just cut the big slabs of meat off each side of the neck. And that stuff is uh, good as a roast. And of course, it's really good if you grind it up too. Now, again, you don't have to field dress the animal first. You can. Uh, on the inside, what you're looking for is the, uh, the heart, the liver, and the tenderloins, uh, which is the column of meat on either side of the spine on the inside. So it's a lot of work field dressing a, an elk. You're basically up up to your shoulders in, in the elk. Uh, and in some cases, it's a good idea to pull that, all that out and put it on a tarp and drag it out of the way, drag that tarp with the gut pile on it out of the way, just cause it's a mess. But particularly if you shot one through the lungs, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of blood on the inside. But what you wanna do is reach up near the neck as far as you can and slice the trachea and the esophagus, which is the windpipe and the tube that leads to the stomach slice those off and just start cutting away with the membrane that's holding it all in and just peel it all out. And again, it's pretty big. It's probably an elk gut pile is probably, I don't know, 20, 30 gallons. It's pretty large. Um, in some instances, I like to keep the hooves on because they serve as kind of a handle you can hold on to. But if you've got a long pack out, you know, the hooves do have some weight to them. You don't have to saw those off. You can use a knife, just come down to the first joint above the hoof and uh, take that knife and work it around and, you know, cutting all the tendons and uh, ligaments and it'll, it'll pop right off. Now, a lot of people like to make asabuco, which is a, a dish that uh, uh, uses the, the uh, you know, the lower leg. And so uh, a lot of times, you know, you might want to keep that hoof on there so that when you take your lower or the quarter to the butcher, you can have him remove that, uh, that shank uh, because, you know, it's actually pretty good if you cook it right. But if you don't want to worry about that, go ahead and take off the hooves and, uh, and, and have at it because they are heavy. So the result, again, laying on a tarp here, you've got your back straps, You've got your scrap meat, which would be your ribs and uh, and your neck. You've got the two uh, the two hams and the two shoulders, and you can see where I've taken the hooves the hoof off of one of those 
hams. Uh, and so that's basically what you end up with. With a deer, you can actually put all of that in one big pack. Um, or at, at the very least, you can get it out in two loads. With an elk, it's a little more difficult. And um, so you wanna use game bags for keeping the meat clean and for transportation and for hanging. One other thing I might mention is if you're near a stream or a little, uh, little pond or whatever, when you are packing or, or uh, working on your elk, you can submerge those bags full of meat in that water. And if it's early season, it'll help keep them cool. That water will not hurt that meat at all. You just want to make sure you wash it off real good before you start processing your meat. But that'll actually help keep it cool. I've never, people say that'll ruin the meat. It, I've, I've been doing that for years and it does not ruin the meat. And don't forget the ivories. Uh, elk have a little tooth. It's a vestigial kind of a fang thing, but it's a, uh, it, we call them ivories and they make really good jewelry and good keepsakes. So, so don't walk off and forget your ivories. Uh, even cow elk have ivories. So and the bigger the bull, the bigger the ivory. So, and that's a, that's a ring I had made with that bull I killed on beach for from the ivories on that bull. So use your pack frame to haul all that stuff. So there's me hauling out a complete uh, doe. I was gonna, um, that's a doe whitetail. I was gonna, uh, my grandson was with me, he helped me blood trail and I was going to uh, boil the skull for him. So I went ahead and kept the head. But uh, as you can see, you can carry easily carry a, a whole deer out on a pack frame. Uh, it's a lot easier than dragging and really quartering a deer only takes about 15 minutes. Now an elk, it's a different story, but um, you know, it's, a, it's a, at least an hour if not longer process but it's a you know in some instances that's the only way to get them out so when you're carrying these animals out this will help you plan just remember a ham's going to weigh 60 70 pounds uh that each ham is one load for me the shoulder and the back strap and the tenderloin is about the same weight uh for each shoulder back strap tenderloin and then the rib meat neck heart liver uh you know again about 40, 50 pounds, the head, antlers, cape, 80 to 90 pounds. And then you might um, uh, just cut the skull cap off. And then with the antlers, the cape is probably gonna be about 40 pounds. Now, uh, one thing that will help reduce this load considerably, if you have a long pack out and the weather is not too hot, uh, because remember, the longer you work, the ch better the chances are this meat can spoil. Uh, but if you've got plenty of time because the weather's cool, you might want to bone your animal. So what you do is you just quarter it first, lay all those quarters out on a tarp, and then you just basically remove the bones from each piece. On a ham, you just work that knife around the bone and just peel those big pieces of meat off. And it's the same with the shoulder. Um, and that really will reduce your weight, you know, your carry weight significantly. But again, if it's a hot day, early season with an elk, uh, you need to get that thing out of the woods as quick as you can and on ice. Hauling elk, that'll just give you an idea. Now these, these two fellows here were high school football players. So they're big fellows. And that'll just give you an idea how big an elk quarter is. Uh, that's a that's a young bull. That's not even a big bull. Again, uh, that's a shoulder. That's one of those fellas hauling out one of the shoulders. Uh, this is a spike bull. This fella killed. Uh, he got the 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 bull and the, all the scrap meat on his pack frame, just the head and all the scrap meat on the pack frame. And he fell, he slipped and fell into a briar patch. And we like to never got him out because it was, <laughs> he had this big load on his back that was so heavy. So again, even a young bull is fairly significant weight. Hauling meat, the lower leg, leg and hoof can make for a good handle for short trips. That's just a deer there, but uh, you can do the same thing with uh, an elk. 
Uh, again, though, if you have to haul them for any distance, you probably want to remove that lower leg because of the weight. Heads are very heavy. That That's about a 300-inch bull that fellow's carrying. Uh, that was one of my buddy Donald Thomas's hunters, and uh, he came back into camp one morning and said they needed help. And I asked him, I said, how far are we going to have to carry this these pieces? And he said, only about 150 yards. And I thought, well, we can knock that out in half hour. When we got down there and that bull had jumped off a cliff and uh, we had to uh, we had to rig up ropes so we could pull ourselves up with ropes with the elk on our back, the pieces of elk on our back. But that's the head and that daggone head probably weighed, I don't know, at least 100 pounds. Um, it was big. Again, hauling heads. That's a, a five by six bull. It's a big mature bull. Uh, one of my clients killed. And it took six of us one trip to get it out. And I uh, I carried the head and it about killed me getting that head out. It probably weighed a hundred pounds. And it, as you can see, it was not uh, flat ground. It was very steep getting that thing out. In retrospect, and it was a warm day, but in retrospect, what we probably should have done is gone ahead and cape that animal and taken off the skull cap. Caping takes a while. That's removing the skin from the head for later mounting. You gotta be very careful around the eyes and the nostrils and the antlers, and it takes a while. So, you know, if it's a hot day, you probably ought to go ahead and get it out. But if you've got plenty of time, it's a lot easier to go ahead and cape that, cape that uh, head out and uh, cut off the, the skull cap with the antlers attached. I will mention one thing, uh, this has nothing to do with hunting in Kentucky, but if you're coming in from out of state with, uh, you know, with a big bull of ungulate, like a elk or a moose or whatever, or a deer, you cannot bring that whole head back into Kentucky. It's a CWD preventative measure. So you have to take the skull cap off or uh, you have to boil that skull before you bring it back and completely put, completely clean it up. Um, uh, that, and that's a problem, uh, you know, sometimes, but now there are taxidermists and taxidermy supply houses that are offering fake skulls. So you can cut the skull cap off and buy a fake skull. If you wanted to do a European mount, and basically you just bolt that, skull cap with the antlers onto that fake skull. Looks very realistic. And that way you don't have to worry about the CWD ish issues. Again, hauling heads. As you can see, I'm straining under that load there. And the rewards of uh, what all this hard work is, you know, all that really good meat, that's uh, elk tenderloin there, uh, sliced up into medallions. And then, of course, you can take the scrap meat and make tacos or a million uh, recipes for elk. And even the heart and the liver, um, you know, are really, really good. And then uh, more rewards. That's uh, that that bullet I had on that bullet I had on my back down off the side of the mountain in that previous slide. That's uh, the result of that bull. Uh, that hunter was extremely proud. Uh, and that's, you know, another reward to all this hard work. So again, pre-plan for ice, meat processors, and taxidermists. And I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, there's a wonderful meat processor down in near Manchester. Uh, it's an Amish owned outfit. They do a really good job, but they're not open, open on Saturday afternoon and they're not open on Sunday at all. So again, you got to pre-plan and find meat processors and places to find ice uh, that, you know, that are going to be open when you need them. And then, of course, make sure you plan pre-plan for your taxidermist if you're, if you're bull hunting or even cow hunting, I suppose. Uh, real quick, uh, if you're interested in hiring a guide or just getting advice, contact the Kentucky Elk Guide Association. Uh, you can go on their Facebook page and get a list of elk guides that are members. And this is a good way to help you have insurance that your hunt will be a quality hunt uh, that will be done in a legal and ethical way.
So if you have any questions, you can contact me at KentuckyWildBill at gmail.com. Uh, it's not that I'm con it's not that I'm Wild Bill. It's just that my Kentucky my company is Kentucky Wild, and my <laughs> name's Bill. So it's KentuckyWildBill at gmail.com. Any uh, questions, uh, John and Joe? Yeah, I got a couple things that I've that I've picked up on there a little bit, and I'm just going to exit us out of full screen there. Okay. So, you mean do anything on my end here? Uh, no, that should be good. Now to get us okay. back to where they can see us. So, so here's my opinion. This is a, this is going to be a little bit blunt, and this comes from years of of working the elk hunt and running into. Um, uh, more often than not, unprepared elk hunters. So that's sort of the premise behind these webinar series. It's just to put good info out there. And, and when people go afield, they're better prepared than I've, I've seen over the years. Some of them are great. Uh, but a lot of times it's that, uh, you know, we, we stay down there at the hazard office during the hunt and somebody comes by at, at, at midnight and they've got a cow down that's laying in the creek bottom that's you know, 500 vertical feet from, from the road. And they had no idea, you know, I've, I've, I've had people pull out a, a dull Swiss army knife and a couple of trash bags. It's, you know, so <laughs> that's always been, it's always been my reason for doing this. So I guess my general, my general idea on this whole thing is if, the, if you're a DIY hunter, you've got to be able to pack out your elk. Don't, you know, don't come to East Kentucky assuming that it'll die close to the truck or that it will, will be on, you know, that there'll be level ground between where the elk goes down and, and your truck. It's just not the case. Uh, we've all spent countless days running up and down the hills and it's just something that you've got to be prepared for. And it's one of those things. That, I mean, elk hunting can be a, a social sport. Bring, bring your neighbor high school football players. You know, they get to see... They get to see some good country, and uh, you're going to need them when you've got when you've got six big loads to haul out with that elk. So um, that's my thoughts on the whole thing. Um, now, of course, if you're with a guide, that's that's usually part of the service they provide, and that's good insurance. You know, they're going to make sure that elk gets out of there. But if you're DIYing it, I think you've got to have a plan, like you say, be prepared, and uh, and either bring some extra people with you or be physically prepared to, to make that, make that pack out for sure. Um, and that, that was great. Um, I, I really appreciate that you had the deer photos in there. I've suggested several people on the phone this summer, especially those people with late cow tags. Um, if you're going to deer hunt, you know, during modern gun season in November, prior to your elk hunt, uh, throw that deer up on the tailgate and quarter it. You know, instead of hanging it in the barn, instead of taking it to the processor, you can still take it to the processor in quarters. They'll be they'll be excited about that. You've done half the work, and they'll charge a little less. Probably. They'll charge a little, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but really, and there are massive differences between elk and deer. But really, the quartering is the same, uh, just on a larger scale with elk. Uh, but just you know, where everything connects, they've got four legs. They, they you know they still. Are connected in all the same ways and it's a good way uh, to get that general kind of basic understanding of how to how to take this animal apart try it out on a deer i mean that that absolutely uh will put you ahead of of you know being out somewhere at dark 30 having to break down a cow so uh, well, the other thing is uh with, and i do i quarter all my deer in the field mm -hmm. now i live in town i don't have a barn to hang them in Yep. I've got some trees I can hang it in, but uh, it's a lot easier to bring home just the quarters. It's a lot easier to dispose of the waste, you know, like the bones and things when you process it, than it is to dispose of that whole torso. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to, to just bring home the quarters and leave that torso in the woods. Um, you know, and I do that. I quarter all my deer in the woods now. I keep a pack frame in my truck and that's just a standard operating procedure for me. It's a lot easier to get that deer out of the woods. Yeah, it really is. And I think it seems daunting to folks at first, but then, you know, a little, a little time on the front end saves you a lot of time when you can walk right in the house and put a quarter down on your, on your kitchen counter and bone it out. It, it just makes it easier. Yeah. 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 Um, 
another thing that I had is, is game bags. And I've been, uh, you know, I've had a sort of an evolution with my game bags. It was trash bags back in the day. Um, but it, it is definitely worth, and you can spend, uh, I've seen some rather expensive game bags, which I'm sure they're great. Um, but having some good cloth game bags, I think is, is an absolute necessity. If you're going to be doing this kind of deal, I got some before my hunt last year. Um, you know, Amazon them. I think they were Allen brand, which makes like shooting products and and different things. Um, you know, like thirty dollars for an elk set and twenty dollars for a deer set. And I essentially took four elk size quarter bags, and then I took those smaller deer bags for my trim meat back strap, that kind of thing. Um, and they were great. I mean, the elk bags are big enough. You can tie a knot in the top and hook a rope to that and hang them if you needed to. But a lot of, you know, people coming from out of town may not expect how dusty uh, some of the places are on, on where our elk live, uh, especially if they're still actively mining or there's a gravel road. I have, I have seen meat come out covered in dust. Um, you know, those game bags are big enough that, that, you know, if you do want to bone your meat out, you can use that game bag as a, as a tarp per se and work off the top of it. But browse around, I, I definitely want to suggest having a good set of game bags and they're reusable. Uh, my wife didn't appreciate, and I may or may not have put them in the washing machine. <laughs> I've done that. Work. <laughs> they had, you know, they had, uh, I, I had quartered, I, I had boned my elk out and put it in a cooler when we were in Colorado and then kind of stuffed those, stuffed those game bags in a, in a trash bag and they had baked uh, <laughs> in the heat, but they went through the washer and of course they're stained a little bit, but they're ready to go for the next trip. And, you know, with, with those, I think easily get, get, you know, as many elk as I, as I kill, they'll probably get 10 or 20 years out of them without, uh, without wearing out so it's money well spent um and they can be used for a lot of other things hell i've got half my hunting gear stored in one of them right now you know you can get uh nylon laundry bags at walmart mm -hmm. and kmart uh that work just as well yep um so that that's always a good you know good option yep. is to do that so yeah, I just definitely, definitely have something. Trash bags work, but they are just not good when it's hot. Yep. You just, yeah. One thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention earlier, there's a YouTube video of Fred Eichler, and he is quartering an elk, a cow elk, and it takes him 10 minutes. They've got a clock running at the side. <laughs> uh, so uh, you might want to try that. Go on, just, I guess you could just go on YouTube, and Google or uh, we could probably for link it. For a quarter an elk. Yeah, it takes him ten minutes. Yeah, I've I've seen that one, and I've seen a good. There's a really good Randy Newberg uh, gutless method where he walks people through that. And the and the gutless method, I can I can take it or leave it. Uh, but but and when we were out west, I did one one way and one the other, and you know it's all right. Uh, it 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 keeps things cleaner a little bit, but. Uh, at the, at the end of the day, I wanted to find my bullet. That's why I gutted mine. So, um, well, if you're going to get heart, liver, and uh, tenderloins, it's a little easier to gut it. Mm -hmm. anyway. Well, the heart and the liver, you got to gut it. But yeah. the tenderloin, you can reach in behind the ribs, even if it's you're doing it gutless, and get the tenderloin. But uh, to get the heart and the liver, you got to gut it anyway. Yeah. So, and sometimes it's easier to wait until after you quarter it to gut it because you're not going to get all that mess on your on your meat mm -hmm. so anyway yep. just uh again fred eichler's got a real good youtube video yeah we'll try to we'll try to link that up under under this webinar because those are two that i you know I, I watched both of those before i went out west just to just to refresh a little bit um and luckily i got to i'm as good as i ever have been at quarter and elk after after we left colorado last year which is which is great um but so the, the other thing I like to pack, and you mentioned just a little six by six foot tarp is a lifesaver. You don't even know you got it in your pack. You can use it for a million other things. But, um, you know, when you've got the when you've got the elk down and whether you're in the woods or in the grass, it, there's just so much stuff and stuff sticks to meat like uh, Velcro. Uh, and it saves you a lot of time in the sort of the post processing when you get back home 
if if you keep it as clean as possible, lay it on a tarp, get it right in a game bag, um, and good to go. And then I think my, you know, my my number one suggestion, and we had this happen out in out in Colorado this year, is we we shot one right at the edge of dark and and spent the last bit of daylight sort of relaxing and and celebrating a little bit, and then realized we were doing that in the dark. You know, if you've got that, it's almost better to start that process in the daylight, get as much of it done as you can before you're running off a headlamp, you know, hacking one out in the dark, that's all right. You know, you're hiking along, but uh, I really wished I'd have kind of used that 20, 30 minutes of daylight we had to get, to get cranking on getting that, getting that uh, bull quartered before it was just dark. Um, you know, doing the headlamp just makes it that more, much more difficult. Um, and that's going to happen. That's a pretty common scenario. You're going to kill one right at the edge of dark, especially early season here in Kentucky. Um, and then just this, this sort of goes back to, uh, to, you know, what Joe and I have seen over the years. Like there was one day that we'd been out, uh, you know, uh, the, the first year that we had our, had our regulated uh, voucher program out there. I had to deal with some, some landowner stuff that morning and was cruising back into town and hit up the McDonald's. And it was, it was a 90 degree September day and there's a, there's a gutted bull elk laying on a, laying on like a 16 foot trailer in there uh, in McDonald's getting lunch. And I knew for a fact that they had killed that one at daylight that morning. Uh, and that just, you know, kind of makes me cry a little bit, but really the, the quartering, I, I would probably never even bring one out whole in the, in the early season if I could. You know, I want to get that animal quartered, get that meat initially cooled down. I mean, elk, their their normal body temperature is 100 degrees. Uh, so when you think about a big elk ham, it's going to be 100 degrees in along that bone for hours. Um, you know, all that meat's going to insulate that. But get that initial heat off of it and get it on ice. Uh, that really, I mean, the meat's definitely going to be better. It's just almost impossible to get one out whole and get it to a processor in September um quickly enough in in my opinion so you know it can be done later in the season and the you know during our cow seasons but thinking about thinking about that cooler thinking about the quartering thinking about the ice is all stuff that just is going to deliver a you know you've gotten lucky to get drawn and you've put in time on the hunt uh just take care of that meat so uh we may have lost joe just now <laughs> so that'll be all right I'm trying to think a couple other other things I had. I think that's about got it. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing up the bear the bear issue. I don't know that we've necessarily had anybody's elk um, lost two bears, uh, but I will point out that our bear population is increasing every year, and it's definitely something to think of. Um, you know, if you've got to leave one overnight, get that thing hung. And the general the general rule is is 10 feet off the ground and about eight feet from either tree. Um, so if you can run a rope between two trees and hang your quarters from that, it'll be, it'll be safe. And there's lots of guidance out there on hanging your food. If you're, you know, hiking in the Smokies or something, they've got good diagrams of how to hang it, but I wouldn't leave it to chance, uh, kind of especially down in that Southern and, and uh, Eastern end of our elk zone where our bear population is higher for sure. So we've, we've had them several times come back the next day after mm -hmm. quartering one just happened to be walking by the you know the torso with another hunter going into the same area and they've completely gone and it and it appeared it appears as though a bear just kind of picked it up and walked off with it um i don't think these bears are dangerous they're not like grizzlies on a carcass right. it's just that you know you know you don't want to lose your meat so and it's good to hoist that meat off the ground anyway if you have to leave it because it keeps it cooler so one other thing I'm thought of is, and I forgot to mention, uh, if you have to leave that meat out in any length of time, go ahead and slice. If you're using, if you got full quarters, go ahead and slice down to the bone, uh, make some slices in that ham and shoulder to to let some of that heat out. Yeah, uh, you know, just one, get get it opened up a little bit. Mm -hmm. you, you all might have touched on. I apologize. I had some audio issues. Um, but one thing that I didn't notice in the presentation that I always do is skin it when I quarter it. Um, I immediately pull that hide off because I think that's very important to get it cool right away. 
And I will reiterate, I do, I'm a huge fan of the small tarp. We just did a, a video last week about, um, you know, things we keep in our pack. And that was one thing I tried to highlight, but um, taking that hide off will reduce the temperature of that meat very, very quickly. And especially if you get it off the ground, even if it's 90 degrees, if you have it off the ground mm -hmm. and it's getting a little bit of airflow, it's automatically going to cool down. And I think I might have audio issues again. I do apologize. The one no, the other thing I'm going to mention, in case it cuts out again, there is a little known on an, on a deer. It doesn't. It's not really that big at all. But on an elk, if you look inside the chest cavity, if you actually gut it, uh, right between the shoulder blades at the kind of the apex of the chest cavity, there's basically a smaller little tenderloin there. Set on a deer, it's about you know, a little bit bigger than a finger, but on an elk, it's about the size of like a deer inner loin. Uh, and it's pretty tasty. Um, but that one gets left in the woods <laughs> quite a bit. And I'll, uh, I'm just throwing that one out there. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, one other thing I will say is, is, I mean, they're, you know, on a deer, you get a couple pounds of kind of trim. If you get the neck and you get the rib and the flank meat and that stuff, I picked over my elk just because I had the luxury, killed it in the morning, had all day to deal with it. And I picked every shred of meat off that thing and ended up with a bag that probably weighed 60 or 80 pounds of, of trim. And that's just something to throw in there and consider, uh, you know, having an extra game bag for that. But also, you know, that adds to you got the head, you got the four quarters, you got the loins and you got a big, massive uh, bag of trim meat which is great. I mean, that's burgers. We ate on it. We had some stuffed peppers last night with, uh, with Colorado elk in it that I guarantee you was out of that, out of that trim bag. And that, that made a lot of ground of ground meat for sure. So, yeah. And I think, you know, in my kind of my theory on, on this is when you quarter an elk, you're going to knock the temp down from, you know, their, their live temp at a hundred, you might get it knocked down to 70 or 80 degrees. And then when you get it in the cooler, I sort of um, plan on having some sacrificial ice. You know, don't expect to throw those quarters in a cooler warm, and put ice on them, and they'd be good till you get back home to West Kentucky. Um, you know, it's going to burn off that ice, but you're taking the temp in those quarters down. Throw some more ice in on top of it, be ready to go. Um, you know, after I did the sacrificial ice in Colorado, it was seven days before I opened those coolers again. So I got some aging time, got all the way back here, worked a day or two, and then started working on 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 my elk on the weekend. Um, and so, and that was no problem. I mean, that's good. It was all in Ziplocs, boned out, clean and ready to go. So got a little aging time and and um, the coolers handled it well. And it will, I will say, I'm, I'm lucky. I won a really awesome cooler at a Ducks Unlimited banquet. But uh, that was just one cooler. My other one is a, you know, $50, $60 one from Walmart, and it did almost as good. And we were in, you know, September, uh, driving back across the, the middle of the U.S. It was, you know, 80, 85 degrees. So have you, have you some coolers, but by no means do, we, do, do you need $1,000 worth of cooler. Just have you, have you something that'll keep some ice for a little while. A couple things I thought of, John, um, one other issue you've got that really almost necessitates game bags early season is flies. Yeah. Uh, those flies will land on those quarters and lay eggs. And so, and you've got, it happens pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So on that one bowl that uh, where Donald told me it was only 150 yards and it was down off the side of the mountain. Uh, by the time we got that elk out, we had that meat in bags, but the flies had laid eggs on the outside of the game bags and we had to you know obviously wash them off yep. but flies can be a big problem early season so game bags is really important the other thing i wanted to mention is another big advantage to quartering an elk is it takes so much less space in your vehicle mm -hmm. i guide my hunters out of an suv a ford explorer and i've got a hitch haul that i can carry more coolers on but I can, you know, a quartered elk, I can put it in the back of an SUV without any trouble at all. Yeah. So can you imagine, you know, there's no way I could get a, a whole elk in an SUV. It'd be oh, impossible. Yeah. It'd be yeah. impossible. And you don't have to worry about hauling around a trailer either, pulling a trailer around. So again, uh, another advantage of quartering. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And there's not many, you know, by the, with everybody with a crew cab truck bed and a five or, you know, crew cab truck with a five or six foot uh, truck bed, they don't, you know, a big old bull elk doesn't necessarily fit in there either. So you'll be, yeah. you'll be driving down the road with, with a, you know, a pretty good part of it hanging over the tailgate. I guarantee you that. <laughs> so, well, Joe, you got anything else? Uh, I don't think I had too much. Uh, I will just, Tell you, Bill. Thanks for for coming on and, and Thank you. helping our Appreciate hunters it. and uh, teach them some of this stuff that that I think is really important for them to hear, especially from someone like you who's done it so much. Um, thank uh, you we appreciate it. I want to say I want to say we appreciate everything you guys at Kentucky Fish and Wildlife do for us. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, I think you all have done a great job, um, and I, I do appreciate it. This would be a good crash course, something that people can refer back to. Um, and and the last thing I'll say, I've, I've I've had hunters before who, you know, have deer hunted for a long time and they're just so hesitant to jump in and it, because it's an elk. Oh, it's different. It's honestly, a, a, uh, you know, from the anatomy, when you're, when you're going through the process of quarter mount, it's really not any different. It's just a much bigger scale. So don't, don't think of this as something that you can't do. If you've deer hunted or even if you watch these videos, you can do it. It's not, it's not the end of the world. It's something that's worth doing. Um, and it's, it's a good, rewarding experience uh, to take this on on your own. But uh, that's really all I got. I do apologize again for the audio uh, issues on my part. But um, thank you very much, Bill, for, for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you out there soon. And good luck to all you hunters out there. Kill a big one. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're moving in. I mean, by the time this video posts, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, the first week of August. And, and we're there we're right around this is kind of the yep. time I get excited for everybody. Um, you know, the elk are going to be changing their patterns. Good time to get out there and scout, especially for our, uh, for our earlier bull hunting seasons. Um, but either way, I'm going to share up. Uh, I've got our contact info like we always do. And uh, I've also got uh, Bill's info on there to share this briefly, but as always, uh, this is Joe and I's office and uh, office phone and email. Holler at us. We've enjoyed, um, we've enjoyed interacting with the hunters. I've got a little bit of backlog uh, on calls. So if you've called me here in the last uh, two weeks or so, I've got you on a big list sitting here and we'll get to it uh, as quickly as possible. Had to dig myself out of the, what I'm going to call the vacation hole there and uh, get, get my head back above water. But either way, uh, as always, we'll, uh, we'll see you back again next week. And thanks again, Bill, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy hunting.